We've got the Nikon D5. It's a beast, it's huge, and it's probably the most expensive 35 millimeter camera ever made. You know why? Because of this. 14 frames per second. It's ridiculous. It's fantastic as a sports camera, but everybody's concerned about the dynamic range and the low ISO noise. So let's test that out first, and then we'll do try everything else out. Good thing I can be really fast with this building here. Yeah. Don't, Don't move, want it to get building. away. When two cameras have different megapixel counts, the most fair way to compare the detail they capture is to scale both images up to the high resolution. As you might expect, the DA10's 36 megapixels capture far more detail. Being cheaper, smaller, and lighter helps too. Increasing the exposure by two stops in post and then scaling the raw images down to the D5's resolution, we see cleaner recovered shadows from the D810. Paying more doesn't always mean you get more dynamic range, and higher pixel density doesn't necessarily mean noisier photos. To test the D5 as a landscapes camera, we photographed a lighthouse with both the D810 and the D5. Because this is a real-world review, we use the camera's native base ISO. Even on a humid day, even at a long distance, the D810's higher pixel count shows noticeably more detail. Even without raising the shadows, the D810's ISO 64 shows noticeably less noise. Considering the size and price benefits, the D810 is the obvious winner for landscapes. So the D5 is $6,500. What do you get when you pay that much for a camera? Well, I feel like this camera is designed with the pro in mind. Amateurs might not take advantage of all the features that make this thing so expensive. Uh, it's got two ways that you can take pictures. You can take it in landscape orientation, and you've got your autofocus and your joystick for your autofocus points right here. But if you turn it sideways vertically for your portrait orientation, you also can take pictures with autofocus and your joystick. This thing is incredibly weather sealed. If you can handle the weather, it's probably right there for you. So you pros that are shooting out in any conditions to get the shot, this is gonna be your buddy. It's got a lot of other features that you might take advantage of if you just need to get that shot. You can change your battery with one hand. And not only that, we took 1,500 shots and an hour of 4K video and still had one bar of battery left. You do not want to be fussing with your battery when you're trying to get the shot of your dreams. Another interesting feature on this camera is that you could get an XQD card. It keeps you from buffering when you're shooting 14 frames per second. You could also get a model of this camera that allows you to use a CF card. When you're shooting professionally, you often need to associate some information with a picture you just took. And the D5 provides two ways to do that. You can use the FM3 button here on the back as a shortcut to a star rating so that you can quickly rate a picture from one to five stars. Another thing you can do is use the voice memo to actually record your voice and associate it with a picture. This comes up all the time. And I'll take a picture of Justin. When you take a picture of somebody at an event or something, somebody's gonna say, hey, could you tag me on Instagram? And then you have to try to figure out what their Instagram is. So now you can just hit the voice record button, photo destroyer on Instagram. Photo destroyer on Instagram. And that's associated with your picture. It's kind of a pain though, if you use Lightroom like I do, just because of bugs and poor design in Lightroom, it's not even Nikon's fault. If you import it directly from the memory card, Lightroom completely ignores the audio file. If you copy it to your disk first and then import it from that, it will copy in the, the audio file. And then to hear the audio file, you have to select it in the grid view and then look at the metadata and then click the little play icon to hear it back. Photo destroyer on Instagram. You wish there were like a little microphone icon or something right in the grid view, but it just doesn't display that. What's the matter? Uh, I think it was obscured and I think it's all, I think it's blurred and stuff, but Cowboy just took a piss. <laughs> I'm not seeing a huge difference in the studio. They both focus quickly and uh, the high frame rate isn't a huge advantage in the studio. They both have USB 3 for tethering, but the D5 also has a proper ethernet port which can allow you to run a longer piece of cable and a more flexible cable because USB 3 cables can be a little stiff. 
That could also be solved by using an optical USB 3 cable, which Corning is making now. One nice thing is I can use a touch screen on the D5 to really like zoom in and kind of pan around. And something like a group portrait where I need to check and make sure everybody's eyes are sharp, that can save time. As we expected, the D810's 36 megapixel sensor again shows far more detail than the D5's 21 megapixels. You don't always need that much detail for a portrait, but it's nice to have because it gives you options for printing large or cropping tight. We often recover shadows and dark hair to add texture when we don't have enough fill. Surprisingly, the D810 also showed better dynamic range than the D5, and the D810's recovered shadows were cleaner than the D5's. Whoa. Really nice and sharp. Some things that I really like about the D5 for studio work are that it has this nice autofocus joystick, which is easy to use. It's easy to make sure that your eye or your subject's eye is always in focus. But also, if you want to shoot in a portrait orientation, you just flip the camera, you still have a joystick for your autofocus. You still have the AF on button right underneath your thumb. And it's so simple to just switch to that portrait orientation to get those portrait shots. Despite the features that I like on the D5, I still like the D810 for studio work. Uh, it doesn't have as many bells and whistles, but it does have a higher resolution. Um, and the autofocus, though not as good as the D5, still works really well. Another advantage of the D810 for studio work is that it's lighter. So if you're going to be hand holding for a long time, you might not want that massive three pound body weighing you down. Okay, so now I have uh, the D5 and the D810 and we'll be using the same settings and the same lens to test the low light capability with high ISO. Ooh, that thing's fast. Yeah, it's really fast and it focuses better. So I already tried the D810 and I know how that performs. The autofocusing is not as good in low light. Um, and it also doesn't have the high ISO capability. Now the D810 is a good camera for us to test because the D750 and also the predecessor to the D5, the D4S, both have the same autofocusing system. So if the D5 is doing better than the D810, we know it's also doing better than the D750 and the D4S. While the D810 won in good light, the D5 wins by an equally large margin in low light. If you can't use flash, the D5 is a much better choice for concerts and dimly lit events like nighttime wedding receptions. If you're thinking you'll get usable pictures out of ISO 3 million, you won't. But we applaud Nikon for not setting an artificial upper limit on the ISO, because even if you don't ever have to use it, it's there if you want it. Sports is where the D5 really shines. I, it could keep going. I'm just gonna stop for audio reasons. You, you know this already if you follow me on Instagram and Twitter, because I already posted these results, but I'd been trying to shoot my kid's soccer game, indoor soccer, through net, and the 7D Mark II couldn't do it, and the 5D Mark III couldn't do it, and the D810 couldn't do it, but the D5 nailed it. It didn't mind shooting through thick black net in super dim light. And in fact, I have yet to find a real world scenario where the D5 won't nail focus, even with fast action. And you know what? The JPEGs looked a lot better too, because a lot of photographers will use JPEGs. So we did an indoor test and you know what happened? The D5 got more than twice as many sharp shots as the second place competitor, which was the 7D Mark II. And and that's amazing, more than twice as much as the 7D Mark II. It's the combination of a really fast frame rate and an amazing focusing system that gets just as close to 100% as we can reliably measure. So basically, if you're shooting any kind of sports and you're having problems with your camera, the D5 is gonna solve that problem. It focuses all the time, it produces the best low light images that we've ever seen. Let's just test the buffer out against the D7200 shooting raw. We usually shoot JPEG for this stuff, but sometimes you want to be able to have a little more control over it. Okay, the, D, the D7200 is buffering already. It's filled up. Okay. 
you can hear the D5 is slowing down just a little. It's hit the limit of its raw file and we're shooting to a really fast XQD. You heard it stop there. All right, so that's the buffer filling up and you can see it keeps shooting really fast even once the buffer fills up. Again, this is an XQD card. It's gonna be faster than the CF card. If you get the CF version, it's not gonna be as fast. Oh, it's slowing down even more. Okay, now the buffer is completely full. Oh wait, now the memory card is full. <laughs> I fill up the memory card. Cause that's how fast you can fill up a 32 gig memory card. <laughs> You'd think with that unstoppable focusing system and buffer that never seems to fill up that it would be perfect for wildlife, except for the low megapixel count. It's a 21 megapixel sensor. And we tend to like really high megapixel sensors because with wildlife, you almost always end up cropping. Here's a comparison shot with the D7200 and the D5. You can see the APS-C sensor of the D7200 gives it 2.6 times the pixel density. Therefore, because we had to crop anyway to get closer to that bird, the D7200 picture looks far better than the much more expensive D5. So yeah, if, if you can get close enough to the animals to really fill the frame. If you have huge glass and teleconverters and you wait patiently to get that close to the animals, it can be good. But in those cases, the high frame rate and the fast focusing system probably won't help you that much. I actually, for that kind of work, I prefer a Canon 5DSR because it has 50 megapixels and that means I can crop a little bit or I can make bigger prints or I just have tons of extra detail to work with. So for me, it's not a wildlife camera, but I'll tell you what, wait until the D500 comes in, because when the D500 comes in, we're gonna get a bunch of Nikon wildlife lenses and we're gonna give it a go and do wildlife photography with it and the D5. So stay tuned. So let's talk about the D5's video camera capabilities. I know it's a stills camera, but Nikon has made a big point of marketing that it can be a 4K camera now. So the first thing we did when we got the camera is we had Justin, who's our cameraman, use it for our other videos to see how it worked and he hated it. I have a 4K video, lousy autofocusing, and it has a three minute recording limitation, but uh, it could also use uh, electronic viewfinder. As anybody would, mostly because of usability. The GH4, for example, costs 1100 bucks and it's got an articulating touchscreen which helps you focus and you can flip it forward so you can monitor yourself. It has an electronic viewfinder that you can look in when you're uh, recording video out in the sun. It has things like uh, focus peaking. And for a hundred extra bucks, you can get a wide dynamic range mode. Shit. <laughs> Clearly I didn't have enough chalk on the cue. That's the only explanation. Uh, oh, and the D5 has a three minute recording limit. Three minutes, and I know right now there's rumors that Nikon's gonna give a firmware update that'll give you 30 minutes. But I talked to Nikon and they wouldn't confirm or deny it. They wouldn't say anything about it. So it might be coming, but I don't want you to buy the D5 thinking that you're gonna get 30 minutes of recording and then never have it materialize. Oh, but the allure of the full frame 4K camera, right? The ability to record full, full 4K, but get that beautiful background blur that you can get from all those inexpensive 35 millimeter lenses you don't get that either because it's got a 1.3x crop on it. So if you really want full frame 4K, you're better off with a Sony a7S, an a7S II, or an a7R II. Oh, and also we found just what seems to be bugs in the D5's video handling. Like when my last test, even though it was in AFS mode where it should have been locked into focus, it just very slowly drifted out of focus over the course of the recording. Also, even though it was in manual mode with manual ISO, it, at one point, the exposure, the brightness of the image just randomly changed. I just still have no idea why. I know I'm shitting all over the Nikon, but I, I do wanna say thank you, Nikon, for putting 4K into a camera. I'm glad, even though it might not be the ideal video camera for everybody, the fact that it has 4K is better than not. By the way, it's tough to talk and play pool. I'm not usually this bad. So why are we comparing this to the a7S and not the a7S II? Uh, we did test the a7S II and it's about a stop better than 
the original a7s but we did not buy the a7s II. we did not upgrade for ourselves because we found we never really needed high high isos like that and we liked using the shogun to record externally anyway but a7s II would give you a better stop better light and i know this high iso is completely unusable but i would also like to thank nikon for putting that in because What's the problem? Like, why not? I, I just always kind of this artificial software construct anyway. Why put an upper limit? Like, the GH4 has an upper limit of ISO 6400, but why? Because you saw it, it doesn't look that bad when it's pushed a little bit. So just take away the upper limit, let us go as high as we need to, and then when we don't need it, we won't use it. It's not like you're required to use ISO 3 million. It's, it's ridiculous, it looks terrible, but mm, might as well take away the limits if they're not there for a good reason. So should you buy the D5 for 6,500 bucks? Probably not. Most photographers will be happier with a D810. Better image quality just all around. Or maybe a D500, which we'll be testing soon. Be sure to subscribe to see that. But there are a couple of people who the D5 is right for. Sports photographers, especially those who have big glass and can fill the frame and therefore don't need to crop. As well as low light photographers, anybody who's going to be shooting at ISO 12,800 and up on a regular basis, people shooting wedding receptions and things like that, don't get it just because you think everybody's going to be impressed or they're going to think you're a pro because you bought the biggest body. Because that's just not the case. You might as well just get a battery grip and throw it on another camera. That'll that'll trick all the civilians and anybody who knows better won't be impressed by the camera that you bought. Anyway, if you can't decide between the two cameras get both. <laughs> I know that's like 10k in gear, but the DA10 is an ideal backup body to the D5 because for those times when you do need that extra dynamic range and resolution, it'll be there for you. As a working pro, you need to make sure that this is going to be a profitable decision for you. So let's talk about depreciation. The D4S went on sale for $6,500 and nowadays it's going used for about $3,800. If you factor in your eBay transaction fees when you go to sell this camera at the end of its life, you can probably expect that it will cost you about 120 bucks a month over its lifetime. So can you turn a profit on that? Is it gonna make that big of a difference from whatever the lower, cheaper body would have cost you? It's kind of up for you to decide. Be sure to subscribe to see our comparisons to the 1DX Mark II and the D500, and we'll be testing it out with a bunch of wildlife lenses. If you have any follow-up questions for me, just add a comment below. Give me a like to help me out and subscribe and share it with your friends. Also check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world. We have books on Lightroom and Photoshop. All those are available if you search for my name on Amazon. There's also a photography buying guide that has lots of information like this about how to pick the best cameras and lenses and other photography accessories and get the most bang for your buck. Thanks.